warm welcome to our session uh, today we will uh, talk about digital technology in order to tackle food security and build smart smart agricultural solutions here is here is a quick overlook to our agenda where we will have lightning talks followed by introductions and then panel discussion So to start with introducing myself, I am Aparna Faithu, a research scientist and agricultural and water lead at Survey Science Coordination Office based at Marshall Space Flight Center, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, I'll give a broad introduction on Survey shortly, uh, and I'll also moderate this session today. It is observed that climate change is severely impacting our livelihoods and especially developing countries. Also, it is observed that disadvantaged and marginalized population, including major portion of farming population across developing part of the world, is adversely affected. In this situation, timely and accurate data-driven and uh, data-driven decisions are in dire need. And in order to tackle the food security uh, issues, the drought or flood related extreme events, these timely and accurate data driven decisions are very important. And satellite data is observed to be a key for that. In this context, a joint initiative of NASA and USAID in collaboration with leading geospatial organizations in Asia, Africa, and Latin America is working towards addressing the critical challenges in climate change, food security, water and related disasters, land use, and air quality. Survey activities and services are distributed across four thematic areas. And here you can see our global survey network. Uh, red dots are survey hubs. What exciting is survey facilitates the digital technology and capability sharing across the globe. Some of the digital solutions and related capabilities um, we develop, they can be shared from one region to another region, from one country to another country. And they, are, they can be and are scaled and replicated across the regions and countries. So survey partners are distributed across intergovernmental agencies, private sectors, and research institutions. A survey is a unique program which brings together appropriate and advanced science partners through NASA Applied Science Team, uh, who are our main research collaborators across US universities and research centers, and connect these capabilities to help developing countries through our USAID hub partners through regional host institutions such as ECMOD, ADPC, and RCMOD. So what is distinctive about survey? As you can see, our services are scaled, shared, and replicated across the service. Uh, across our regions and countries. So that's one of the unique distinctive characteristics of survey. The second part or second thing which is gender inclusion approach of survey. So this gender inclusion approach in the survey is included towards any development of tools and services or any co-development of tools and services across the survey network. For example, here you can see how we incorporate gender inclusion and tools and our services and how the capacity building across the hubs also here at NASA and USAID is implemented. For example, if you see at survey Eastern and Southern Africa region, this region is currently working on the gender sensitive agricultural insurance initiative. Another distinctive feature about survey is its open science approach towards planning the service toolkit and developing the science. 
So I quickly provide an overlook into some of our uh, services and tools. Uh, later, our session speakers and my colleagues will go in detail to some of these use cases. Uh, first service is crop monitoring service. Uh, in this service, crop land extent and crop type mapping system implemented in Kenya. This service not only measures the areas, but also assesses the changes in crop lands. And these timely and accurate satellite database crop measurements are used for many purposes. My colleague Catherine will talk in detail about it shortly. Here you can see some of our, um, our another crop monitoring tool to map crop type areas and monitor its productivity and conditions uh, using optical satellite datasets as well as SAR datasets. Next is our crop yield forecasting service or uh, crop yield forecasting tools. Uh, Survey with its applied science team uh, has been building crop yield forecasting tools uh, in different regions. So here is just one of that example where one of our applied science team PI has built this crop yield forecast model uh, for Eastern and Southern Africa maize crop yield forecasting. Second service I would like to introduce to you is Climate so, uh, In order to build climate smart and climate resilient practices, weather datasets are critical inputs. This service provides access to several weather in dataset inputs, for example, rainfall datasets from jobs. As an example, currently this service is being used by Kenya's meteorological service offices. This service is to highlight drought monitoring. Here there are two examples. Uh, on the left is drought early warning system and on the right is national agricultural drought watch system in Nepal. This next service is our high watt or high impact weather assessment tool service. The survey has created a state of art for satellite based severe weather forecasting system for South Asia and has trained forecasters in Nepal and Bangladesh in its use. This service is currently being used by government of Bangladesh to produce high accuracy forecasts and warnings. A high watch system addresses several extreme weather events, which in turn impact the agriculture and its productivity and the overall livelihood system. In Southern Amazonia, fires are one of the key drivers impacting the regional food security. So this particular service forecasts the fire and also classifies them in real time for better planning and decision making. Here is our another water monitoring service, which is helping for West African for our stakeholders and in part helping the pastoral, pastoralists in the region. So this is another service open source platform to collect individual or crowdsource reference data to classify and monitor land cover, land use change areas, including croplands and range lands. So while I provided the overlook of uh, our sum of services and tools, our today's speakers and my colleagues will give lightning talks on some of it. They will also discuss the challenges in developing these digital solutions, its need of co-development and challenges to scale and expand them across different regions and countries. So let's start with Pete and let me introduce uh, Pete to you all. Dr. Pete Ipanchin is leads the climate adaptation team within USAID Center for Resilience. He and his team work with USAID community and with partners around the world, bringing technical assistance and leadership in support of adaptation to climate change across sectors. Welcome, Pete, and over to you now. Thanks, Aparna. Uh, so NASA and USAID might 
first seem like quite the odd couple uh, in this partnership. But as Aparna has just really nicely laid out, NASA has amazing technological capacity along with a constellation of satellites that are orbiting our home planet. And USAID has a presence in countries around the world where when we bring these together and collaborate with local partners, we can quickly see the potential of such a partnership. And I, I really wanna stress that collaborations with partners are key. Severe is not just USAID and NASA, and this panel will very much bring that to life. And it's through this broader Severe network that allows for our work to be used and to be shared locally in the contexts where services are designed and applications are developed. Uh, and also for these methodologies and approaches to really go from hub to hub, to be shared, to be picked up from one severe hub in one location and, and taken and applied elsewhere. For example, um, uh, we've seen this sort of leapfrogging and repurposing of replicable technologies with a surface water mapping tool that our severe Mekong colleagues originally developed to understand the risk of floods and the impacts from existing and proposed dams in the region. And then some of these approaches were used in Senegal to help pastoralists understand surface water availability during the dry season. Uh, Parna touched on that service as well. Um, and so that type of information can support decision making ab about where to take livestock when water is scarce in the Sahel. And, and, and staying, let's go back, just we're going to stay with that slide for a moment, thanks. Um, I only have two slides, so we'll stay here for a second. Um, so some of that, that same technology that originally came from the Mekong, went to uh, West Africa, was again repurposed to support flood mapping information as requested by disaster response and management agencies in Central America after uh, the region was hit by two back-to-back -back hurricanes a few years ago. So we really see that movement of application that's developed in one region um, be, be tailored and, and, and taken elsewhere in the world. And that's an advantage really of uh, both the, the network, um, but also the approach in terms of technological uh, uses of, of remote earth observation data. Another great example of scaling agricultural interventions in the SEVERE network is with RIAS, the Regional Hydrologic Extremes Assessment System. So RIAS is this framework that ingests diverse data sets and uh, couples agricultural and hydrologic models to predict drought and crop yield. Its regional implementation is with uh, SEVERE partners, both in Eastern and Southern Africa and in the Mekong region. Uh, and so the Kenya Ministry of Agriculture uses this system for estimating crop yield and to help inform food security outlooks and in the Mekong, we see it used by the Mekong River Commission and partners in Vietnam for drought monitoring and forecasting, including the predicting the effects of, of drought on crop yield and for management of, of irrigation water for improved food security in the face of climate extremes and, and climate variability. And so now we can go to the next slide, please. Um, because really to understand these, uh, how these work, we should just take a few steps back to really um, dig a little bit deeper into this uh, service planning approach that, um, sorry, if we can go back to that same slide, um, uh, we can really understand what the challenges are and the contexts are where we work. So once we have our, you know, this is where the, the, the hubs and, and working with partners on the ground really is important um, because USAID and NASA, we're, we're, we, we, we don't necessarily have the correct connections um, to, to work with a full range of partners, to understand their needs, to engage them um, as active co-developers in the services, and to really work with them in code design of, uh, of a service to meet the needs. And so it's through this approach that Severe has developed the Severe Planning Toolkit. And the toolkit uses um, an approach to inform service planning that is uh, been informed over years of decade, uh, sorry, years of experience and best practices. And so one of the lessons that we've learned is really um, to just leave the assumptions behind. So oftentimes, uh, if a service is developed with this, the developer's assumptions, it's going it, to we will no longer have the context uh, at the of the local level to understand what those user needs are. 
And so through a consultation needs assessment process and understanding those, those uh, local contexts, so important for these services to be effective and for them to be well used. So by actively engaging and, and, and asking stakeholders to participate in the process of designing and implementing a service is, is really important in order to, to get it right and to produce something with, with strong uptake and uh, an application and use. We've, we've recently gone through an update on the service planning toolkit to ensure that services are gender responsive. Trevere's approach and what's now uh, included as guidance in the toolkit is really for service planning to be more inclusive of women as co-developers, as well as um, services to be more responsive to need women as service users and beneficiaries. And service, Trevere uh, also does promote a service planning approach that's um, uh, that, that is really anchored in understanding the challenges at hand. And um, that includes who's impacted, what types of data are needed, decision-making context, and the capacity gap the need of, um, of to, to inform the problem and what solutions might be most relevant. And how to then inform and communicate information coming from a uh, service so that action can be taken and action can be put. So this approach has really helped improve and adapt our geospatial services to strengthen capacity uh, and, and to have clear goals and ways to measure our impact. And that's where the monitoring, evaluation, and learning piece is going for. And so with this increased focus and attention on users, it's really through service planning that we're able to see increases and in uptake, the sustainability of services, and to build resilience to climate and so with this higher framing on the approach that we take in service development and service delivery and use, uh, we'll now go on to our next speakers in the panel and hear more details and examples from them. Thanks so much. Oh, and I have the website there for you can go and take a look at the service planning toolkit. Uh, it is live on the website for at servereglobal.net. Thank you, Pete. Next lightning uh, talk we have from Vivian Bingo. She's the Agriculture and Food Security Survey uh, Eastern and Southern Africa thematic lead based at Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development, also called as Asimadu, Kenya, uh, where she uses geospatial technology and remote sensing to design services, products, and tools to address challenges in agricultural and food security. Through her work with Survey, additionally, Lillian was selected as a rising, uh, rising star in 2021, inaugural geospatial World 50 Rising Star List, and she's a 2021 African Food System Leadership Fellow uh, at Vangen Indian University. Over to you, Lillian. Thank you, Rapana. Hello, everyone. Um, so to begin with, RCMRD is based in Nairobi, and it provides uh, its goal is to strengthen the use of geospatial and ICT-driven uh, tools and products and services within governments in 21 member states in East and Southern Africa. And um, one of the main uh, activities that we have been doing at the Agriculture and Food Security is that we have been working to develop scalable and repro reproducible intelligence systems. So moving from the old ways of developing other observation-based products to adopting machine learning and um, the most recent technologies to produce services and products that respond to specific needs from the government. And as Pete mentioned, all of this is actually driven by a very comprehensive uh, consultation and needs assessment process where we consult with the governments and the stakeholders and identify their priorities in decision making that can be addressed using other observation based products. An example of this is the cropland and uh, crop type mapping that we developed initially in 2015 and for whose the methods that we are actually using has um, evolved. Oh, I don't know. I think there's someone who needs to mute their mic. Um, there's a lot of background noise. Oh. Hello. 
We can uh, thank you. I hope that I'm now audible. Um, thank you, Aparna. So what I was saying is that we started doing the cropland and crop type mapping in 2015. And this is a service that had, has grown. And now we are using machine learning and transfer learning for within season um, crop type mapping to support the government of Kenya and recently expanding to Zambia uh, to support the government decision making. In Kenya, we are currently supporting the Kenya Crop Insurance Project uh, by developing a GIS-based sampling frame. And the insurance, uh, the crop insurance covers around 4,000 uh, farmers. And through the interventions by Savir, uh, the government has reduced the implementation cost in one county or district by 70%. And these maps have also had some uh, different uses at the national level to inform food security assessments and is an input to some of our digital monitoring systems. We've also developed the yield production and estimation model using RARES, which has been mentioned earlier, and this is an input to the Kenya Digital Food Balance Sheet. And at the same time, because of the networks and the interventions that Saviri is making in the Eastern Southern region, we are also the technical um, partner for the implementation of the regional food balance sheet, where we are looking at modeling and using other observation to develop production estimates for six countries in Eastern and Southern Africa and covering three crops, maize, beans, and rice. And for this, we are adopting a multimodal approach and leveraging on the skills across the severe network. And we have also uh, collaborated to develop tools and data sets and services that are focused on agricultural risk monitoring. Key among them, um, just to mention last year, uh, we had the first desert locust invasion in Eastern Africa and Savir was at the forefront of contributing towards, uh, contributing enhanced soil moisture data to assist in the desert locust uh, monitoring. We've also together with the University of Maryland implemented crop monitors in five East African countries. And these crop monitors are being used to provide within season and timely information for supporting agricultural interventions. And in the Kenyan rangelands, we are also working on ground and surface water monitoring. Please go to the next slide. And we, with, the, with the growth and with the change in, in the methods for mapping and producing these outputs, and with the need to scale these services, there have also been innovations in ground data collection. And we have been collaborating with partners to develop responsive and appropriate uh, user interface and hybrid systems that leverage the power of our ground networks to collect and strengthen the other observation-based systems. But also we are working to strengthen the government data collection systems by promoting dialogues on um, data standards and openness, as well as working towards building their capacity to produce quality data by uh, building capacity in metadata and standards, but also strengthening the rapid assessments. As the need for ground data uh, grows, we have been um, collaborating to develop uh, tools that can be used to fill the gaps that we have, but also uh, leveraging on the networks that we've created, some of which, especially the countries where we are implementing crop monitors, where we have a tool such as WhatsApp being used for rapid assessments. Can we go to the next slide? And as Pete mentioned, we have been working towards gender sensitivity in our services. And in, in Eastern Southern Africa, there are three things to mention. The first one is the quality index insurance certification. And for this, it's a standard for assessing the quality of index insurance by looking at how often it's able to trigger when an extreme event occurs, but also the inclusion of women in, 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 in understanding how best to communicate index insurance as a resilience tool for communities and families. Together with the climate team, we have worked with partners in East Africa and in specific basins to support the development of climate change impact assessments and adaptation plans through mapping of um, uh, climate vulnerability. But we've also gone ahead to train the technical experts within the ministries, the MET agencies, on how they can uh, contribute toward development of gender-sensitive climate information. And recently, we are working on a 
project that is called Great Gains or Gender Inclusive Agricultural Insurance that is seeking to strengthen agricultural productivity by collecting data and promoting the, the and, and opening up dialogues on the need for gender sensitivity, gender empowerment, and gender communications in the design of insurance products. We'll go to the next and last slide. And, and as systems evolve, uh, one of the most important things that have happened is that we have started going beyond what we call application ready data. So application ready data is where we have photos where we put out observation data and we process it from one level to another so that uh, users with limited uh, capacity to use that observation can still use these photos and digital dissemination uh, platforms to access this data in an easier way. But you find that some of these photos do not necessarily respond to the specific needs of the decision makers. And towards this, there are three examples that I've mentioned that respond to the uh, changing needs and the evolving needs of our stakeholders and where we are seeking to develop more responsive systems that directly address the specific needs of stakeholders. Key among them is the CB Fuse, which is a um, flood-based early warning system that sends flood warnings via SMS once a flood is detected upstream. And it combines the power of remote sensing and um, sensors and SMS is to take that information to the next level. And again, we're working with the National Drought Management in Kenya and Kenya Red Cross and other drought actors to provide them with information that is supporting early warning and early action to ensure that anticipatory actions are made before uh, the drought becomes an emergency. And again, I cannot um, wrap up without mentioning the crop monitors and these again are going beyond uh, putting data into web-based portals to creating a linkage between existing information sources such as information from the ground and information from other observation portals and other information, credible information sources within the government to provide easy to use monitoring tools within the region. And these are being used in five countries with plans to ex expand to the sixth country this year. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. We have another uh, speaker, Dr. Fezel Kame. Uh, he served in the Kushimalaya Agricultural and Food Security Lead based at International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. His research is focused on develop, uh, developing earth observation and climate information based solution and services in the education region. Uh, and his work spans across Isimor's eight regional member countries with special emphasis on Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan. Additionally, Faisal is also serving as a member of board of directors at the International Society of Agromatics and contribute in the group on earth observations, capacity building activities related to the agricultural and food security. Welcome Faisal and over to you. Thank you very much, Aparna. Uh, as mentioned by Aparna, the survey RHKH is hosted at the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development here in Kathmandu. EC mode works for mountain communities in the eight Himalayan countries. Next slide, please. So as uh, men briefly mentioned by Pete, conventionally technology dominated disciplines are driven by supply side with little focus on end user. This results in disconnect between cutting edge technology products and that were developed and the specific needs of the user as well as their expertise to handle those technologies. To avoid this mismatch, we follow survey planning approach, which ensures active engagement of stakeholders. In this solution design, we emphasize on simplicity and make it handy for the practitioners and the CN makers with limited expertise in geospatial technologies. In this process, we are supported by applied science team from US universities who bring state-of-the-art technologies while colleagues from EC mode facilitate the customization of technology in local context. In our previous slide, Aparna, please. Sorry, no, no, sorry. 
yeah this one yeah okay. in uh, uh, we start most of our activities the thematic activities uh, based on the need assessment in our larger need assessment we found the scope of need for earth observation based information provisioning for various nature of decisions including sustainability assessment for policies decision support tools for seasonal assessments farmer level agriculture advisory as well as there is a potential scope for utilizing earth observation information for climate risk management i'll be presenting a snapshot of collaborative work in these areas for enhancing national capacity for improved food security decision making in the hkh region next slide please so here uh, uh, this is the context of pakistan in the semi arid conditions of pakistan mismatch of cropping practices and its environmental conditions causing serious threat to sustain long term productivity here survey hkh is collaborating with pakistan agriculture research council on updating agroecological zones of pakistan as part of its agricultural transformation plan envisaged by the government to protect interest of growers consumers and local industry the use of remote sensing data products are contributing for a clear understanding of cropping patterns historical changes socio economic context and uh, which is essential for developing well well informed policies so we are engaged with pakistan agriculture research council on customizing our crop mapping tools for the purpose of uh, 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 agriculture land use uh, changes identification of agricultural land use changes as well as modeling of uh, sustainable assessment for new uh, revising the agroecological zones next slide please yeah uh, in, in terms of seasonal assessment uh, supporting seasonal assessment or capacity of national institutions in seasonal assessment we are working with ministry of agriculture in nepal to design and employ earth observation based crop area and yield estimation for enhancing institutional capacity in our first wider assessment which was uh, done during the covid peak conditions despite logistical challenges the wall to wall mapping of rice field uh, distribution supported special planning of rice procurement process during covid restrictions and we continued these assessment for next year during during 2021 floods at the crop maturity stage in the month of october caused major damages to rice crop the satellite remote sensing brought great value to damage assessment and farmer compensation process by the government of nepal uh, can we move ahead yeah so here uh, i'm talking about uh, Uh, one of uh, regional data product which is being used in bangladesh nepal pakistan and afghanistan the regional drought monitoring outlook system facilitates the data analysis and aggregation for information uh, informed agriculture planning in these four countries uh, in nepal uh, this data is being used for agriculture advisory process both at national level as well as at local level and in bangladesh and in pakistan uh, national agriculture research councils are using this uh, system for their seasonal assessment in in addition to regular use of national drought product in the uh, the world food program is using these assessments for their quarterly uh, bulletins and as well as like uh, we have been supporting government of afghanistan in drought impact assessment uh, in the most recent drought happened in 2021 Uh, next yeah like uh, i have been talking about most of the usages of our information for uh, national planning or uh, regional planning purposes here in this effort we are trying to promote use of climate information in local context in the hkh region most of the farmers particularly small holding farmers are dependent on public extension system for crop advisories to improve the performance and effectiveness of public extension system we are integrating use of ict and climate information in the advisory process context specific uh, technological and institutional platforms have been established to operationalize the pluralistic uh, system at local level the data solution is designed around the existing institutional functions and professional responsibilities for avoiding new tasks and complexities 
since the public sector extension system is largely similar in the uh, EC more regional member countries. Uh, thus, it will be possible to extend this, uh, this service and this system uh, to other uh, countries beyond Nepal. Yeah, next slide, please. So how we see that uh, uh, we, we are uh, doing some sort of uh, uh, like uh, uh, at least one, one kind of decision is being supported in each country and then some of the functions are regional in nature. But uh, what we see that we wish to build uh, on the existing capacities and continue working with national institutions on expanding user enhanced services functions as per emerging needs and support the service adoption process. Working with multilateral, uh, I, I did mention about uh, uh, climate risk financing, but we have not made yet any breakthrough uh, in this area. While we see that we have uh, several products which can be embedded into the risk financing process or products. We, we look forward to work with multilateral bank on, uh, banks on this. We will continue promoting use of data products and services for process like loss and damage assessments, integration of climate risk and adaptive capacity assessment in the formulation of agricultural land use policies. Thank you very much. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Fazil. Uh, next, let me, let me introduce you to our next speaker, Suzanta Jayasinghe. Suzanta is Agricultural and Food, Secu Food Security Survey Mekong Lead based at Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, ADPC. His professional background is in meteorological and hydrological modeling, forecasting, and early warning systems. Additionally, he is involved in areas of climate risk management and climate change adaptation. Uh, welcome, Suzanta, and over to you. Thanks, Aparna. So, hello, everyone. So I am trying to begin a, like a case study uh, from the lower Mekong region. So how we use the uh, modeling and the latest technological capacities, uh, maybe the geospatial technology to support the countries to tackle um, drought and uh, crop yields uh, issues in the regions. So next slide, please. Yeah, so we know that maybe the actual, the, the real world uh, problem. So when we have like a limited rain, so then the, maybe all the uh, drought situations are maybe occurring. So with the uh, limited uh, capacities of the modeling capacities of the data analyzing capacities within the countries and the region. So then we were not able to have like uh, uh, accurate uh, forecast. So then we have like inaccurate forecast, then the, the other following um, uh, steps also going to be inaccurate. So when we have like an inaccurate maybe drought forecast, then we will be having like unreliable advisories or the drought advisories, then it, it will be finally affected to like um, uh, loss of uh, uh, production of the crop. So this is uh, to, uh, to, sol uh, to have a, like a solution for this real world problem. So then we thought of having a developing uh, or like a bringing a geospatial technology uh, having like uh, uh, developing a system to support the countries in the region. Next slide, please. Yes, so to support this, the countries, uh, maybe identifying the like real world issues, I mean, the uh, other issues in the, having the uh, technical agency in the region. So we thought of having like a service planning delivery approach to having the end to end solution to giving the countries. So when we're having the demand from the, um, the regional partners as well, the, uh, maybe national um, partners in the countries. So we try to bring in a solution, geos uh, geospatial technology solution to have like, uh, uh, the, the proper um, solution to uh, tackle those issues to finally see the impact uh, uh, throughout this maybe process. Next slide, please. So then we thought of developing like uh, operational framework, how to bring in the technology to support the country. So here we thought of developing uh, maybe using the geospatial data sets available, freely available, open source, uh, other uh, model, models and the data sets to support the country. So here we try to bring in a, a model called areas, maybe Pete, uh, he mentioned during his speech as well. So we try to bring in the, this RIAS modeling platform to the region and also maybe linking with the other, uh, maybe data sets available from the, uh, for example, Google Earth Engine data sets 
to have to produce the necessary drought uh, indices as well as the crop um, uh, forecast information through this maybe integrating these models and the data sets. So when we are finally we develop a like online um, platform to distribute this data to the countries as the other regional partners. So then the finally uh, maybe the agricultural extension officers or the maybe agricultural ministries. So they will be benefited from and not only this maybe government institute other from the national maybe the public general public also uh, going to be benefited from this uh, uh, effort. Next slide. Please. Yes, so if I give like uh, um, some kind of maybe deep information about this modeling platform, this is like the, the RIAS platform called Regional Hydrological Extreme Assessment System. It's, it's like a hydrological now cast and forecasting framework developed by NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This has like two uh, core modules, so weak hydrological model, uh, bringing the all uh, drought related information. Then the, we have like modified uh, the set component there. Um, to have a like uh, crop related information. So these all the uh, the modules, so we have integrated the post GS database to easily um, produce the re uh, required outputs. Next slide. Yes, so this is how we bring in the now cast and forecast information from the overall process. So we are, we are integrating a numerous satellite data sets as well as the modeling data sets. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so weak hydrological models is uh, producing required um, variable that we need to uh, produce to have the right drought information. Then it is all the, um, maybe the drought information coming from the weak model, we are integrating the set crop model to generate the uh, crop yield related information. Next slide. Yes, so here's a, like a possible uh, satellite data set that we can ingest through this model. So there are new metal satellite product that we can integrate it in different maybe uh, specification, which has like a different resolution, different uh, time period or the temporal resolution, but the, but the model is capable of maybe handling this all into the, uh, the, the common uh, resolution as well as the common uh, temporal resolution. So the, here, the most important thing is the the forecasting information coming from the seasonal forecasting products, so which is available from the like uh, North American multimodal and central, all the if, 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 if we need, so we can integrate the other uh, maybe seasonal forecasting products also to generate the required uh, forecasting information in terms of the uh, drought as well as the crop. Next slide. Yeah, the, the model is uh, producing, uh, maybe the, this platform is uh, giving the many. Um, drought related information in these, then the other variable like soil moisture, so soil temperature, as well in the like very high resolution, like five kilometer resolution in the like countries, national scale as well as the regional scales. Not only the like modeling output, we are having like a climate change projection as well for the like a long-term planning. Next slide. Yeah, so this is the platform. So maybe that's like a publicly available platform. So anyone can access to this uh, given URL. Next slide. Yeah, so if we if I talk maybe a little bit more about the crop uh, information uh, generation part from this model, so we are using like a different ensemble approach to produce the crop yield statistics to this model. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so this is like a, some kind of validation result from the uh, focusing Cambodia, uh, the country. So so we have like maybe reliable uh, outputs so that we can generate to this uh, model. Next slide. Yeah, this is like uh, maybe online uh, uh, web uh, platform so that we are distributing this all the um, the crop uh, yield forecast information to the country. This, but this is showing the like our uh, attempt, uh, like like previous uh, se season how we have forecast in the crop rice crop yield for the like uh, one of the province uh, in uh, Vietnam country. So. Uh, so so this time also our attempt of them may be forecasting the, the probable uh, crop yield for this uh, ongoing season in, the, uh, in Vietnam as well as the other countries. Next slide. So there are many ways of improving actually uh, these results. So there are maybe uh, we can bring in uh, like a bias correction of this input data first before integrating the model. Then we have like data assimilation approach also further improve the outputs. So there are like ensemble approach to reduce the uncertainty 
So we can use like a number of uh, in simple times to maybe run the model in calibration of the can be set model before uh, operational uh, use. Next time. Yeah. Next time. Yeah, there are many use, use cases from this uh, around this active our effort in the region. So maybe like many uh, UN agency like FAO, WFP in the Pacific Disaster Center, they are maybe operational use these products in the region, like the Mico River Commission, it's like region is true that we are using our information for the, like day-to-day uh, -day, uh, activities or the, like forecast information to dis uh, disseminate to the like end user like farmers in the region. Next slide. So like there are many uh, publications around that we have already published in like uh, international and the like national uh, journal as well as the, like other conferences. Next slide. Yeah, finally, actually, so the long term uh, sustainability in the uh, the use of these products in the in the countries as well as the region. So we are doing like uh, numerous maybe capacity building activities. So there may be national and the like uh, the regional institute to build their capacity the use of this. Uh, data and uh, models for their like uh, uh, maybe operational works. I think uh, I'm, uh, yeah, this is my overall um, presentation. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Susanta. Next, we have uh, Dr. Catherine Nakalambe with us. Catherine is service agricultural and food security food security applied science team lead. She's an uh, associate research professor at the University of Maryland's Department of Geographical Sciences. She's also the NASA Harvest Africa program director and a member of the NASA Survey Applied Science team. Recently, Catherine was honored with the highest civilian award, the global, uh, the Golden Jubilee Medal Civilians of Uganda. Additionally, in 2020, she was also named the Africa Food Prize Laureate, recognizing her dedication to improving food security in Africa through the enhanced earth observation. Welcome, Catherine, and over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Aparna. Um, if we could go to, I guess, the first slide. So um, the, the focus of my, my talk is, um, and I try to uh, keep within time, is to talk about or give some examples of how we get from remote sensing observations to actionable information in national and regional monitoring. And it will kind of contextualize some of what um, Lillian has said. And I will uh, mention some of the other projects that Apana already mentioned that are currently working under the Applied Sciences team. Um, so in the Applied Science Sciences team, you have um, leading uh, researchers who are working on tools um, using applying satellite remote sensing uh, that could be useful in a context um, if you go to the next slide but there is a lot of work that comes from um, when we have the satellite data into uh, a model or a system and then into workflows and then into a product and then into a decision. So it's a very long process. And from the previous presentations you've seen, there's a lot of work that goes into um, planning, uh, uh, you know, such as the service planning toolkit is important because there's not only the regional context, there's institutional context that has to be accounted for. Um, there's a lot of development that goes into making models and tools, uh, not only making the, the data high quality or uh, the methods as good as possible, can't say that they're 100% uh, ever, but as good as possible, and then going to uh, an application training and uh, working with people who can apply those tools, moving them forward, just like uh, uh, we do with the hubs. Um, and then... Uh, understanding the context to make a product out of those, those, uh, those tools. So I will speak specifically about um, what I consider as an application framework for agriculture. If you could go to the next slide, just for, um, just for a visual um, to give an example. So we come from satellite data, uh, just like the case of the, the, uh, the project that I'm leading, which I will focus on a little bit. Uh, from those satellite data, we combine them with ground data that's being collected, as Lillian mentioned, with some of the applications and tools that have, uh, uh, have been deployed, uh, that are constantly being improved, I should say. 
Um, combine that with, for example, with machine learning approaches and then extracting information that could be useful. So information like crop type, uh, crop condition, crop yield. And then uh, to get from that information into uh, a product or into a policy initiative or into something useful for a country, it's, it's a whole other process. And so under the current applied sciences team, if you could go to the next slide, um, there are five um, ongoing projects, and these are the other uh, full projects. So I'll, I'll speak to the one that I'm uh, particularly focusing on. And in the top right, you know, focusing on developing a rangeland monitoring tool, uh, which uh, agriculture, food security, rangelands are pretty important, critical in a lot of geographies. Uh, one that Apana has mentioned in the top right, uh, looking at uh, regional forecasting, which is, uh, you know, inter intertwined and as well as collab um, provides a lot of more context for some of the work that we are doing ourselves. Uh, one looking at rice monitoring and uh, one looking at expanding this rice model that has also been mentioned before. So if you go to the next slide, uh, focusing in on the, the project that um, I'm leading, uh, this is building on work uh, that we've done in the crop monitors, where even though the crop monitor tools are really critical, they're really important, they're practical, and they're probably one of the best tools that is available to institutions within East and Southern Africa to monitor crop conditions, compile information from different sources. Um, we are working to make sure that they're up to speed. So there are always new satellite data, but then also some of the fundamental data uh, data in, in the crop monitor um, have to be updated or have to be based on you know, more robust methods. So we're working on improving, for example, baseline data sets that go into this. If you go to the next slide, it was, uh, so just next please, uh, next slide please. Uh, these are the crop monitors that Lillian's mentioned. If you can go to the next slide, I'll just speak specifically about what we're doing. So we're uh, scaling methods for cropland model modeling using machine learning approaches. Uh, this model that we have, it's a long short-term memory uh, model. We've applied it to Kenya, to Rwanda, uh, to Uganda. We're improving it for Malawi, for example, and it's input for uh, crop conditions monitoring. If you go to the next, uh, is an example of um, how we combine satellite time series data like uh, the normalized difference vegetation index, uh, rainfall, temperature, the, the table that you see on the right hand side, into a machine learning framework uh, we call GeoCIF for forecasting yield as well as giving conditions assessment. If you go to the next slide, um, is an example of how uh, that information can be summarized. So this is an example of a summary from Malawi from uh, estimates made with uh, the GeoCIF model. If you go to the, the that slide, uh, the next slide, please. Um, and this is an example of, uh, we came from the data that I was mentioning from before, combining it into very simple interpretable products that can feed into, for example, this yield forecasting system. So now we have a, a forecast, we have a, a way of visualizing the information and the next steps are, how do you integrate it? How do you evaluate it? How do you make it better? And uh, we continue to work on, uh, on those types of things, uh, particularly working with uh, the Sevilla Hub, working with uh, Lillian and the team at RCMRD. Um, and I think that's uh, my last slide. So thank you, Catherine. Uh, next, we have Dr. Shradhanan Chukla. He's a service weather and climate applied science team lead and also is an associate researcher at Climate Hazard Center uh, of the Department of Geography at University of California, Santa Barbara. His research focuses on improving our drought monitoring and early warning capabilities using advanced earth observation models remote sensing data sets and through capacity building. Uh, so welcome Shrav, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Aparna, and, and thank you everyone for joining. 
Um, in this presentation, uh, I will briefly describe uh, an ongoing project which aims to use sub-seasonal climate forecasts uh, to improve climate services in West Africa and support food insecurity early warning. Uh, and by sub-seasonal forecast, I mean uh, 30 to 45 days uh, in future. This project is supported by Servier and is being conducted in uh, close collaboration with AgriMet, which is the regional climate center in West Africa. Next slide, please. Uh, so just a couple of key messages that I hope uh, we can take away from this presentation. So several countries in West Africa are prone to food insecurity. Uh, drought obviously leads to or worsens food insecurity. Hence, forecasting drought uh, is an integral part of food insecurity early warning. Our work shows that the latest sub-seasonal forecast, again, about a month or so in future for multiple global climate models can help improve drought forecasting and provide necessary information at fine spatial scale, which are most relevant for decision makers. And in this project, we are currently building a 21st century water deficit forecasting system for uh, West Africa. Next slide, please. So just, just uh, in, in this example, we're uh, just using an integrated phase classification, uh, IPC reports on acute food insecurity over the last 10 years or so in West Africa. And the point of this slide is just to highlight that in a number of uh, countries in West Africa, uh, they are generally prone to food insecurity and the map here highlights those regions that have experienced either stressed or crisis level of food insecurity at least once and often uh, more than once in the last 10 years or so. Next slide, please. So why do we think sub-seasonal climate forecast can be useful in, in this case? Uh, first of all, uh, our ongoing research shows that monthly climate conditions uh, in West Africa are correlated to the overall seasonal vegetation condi health conditions. And that overall uh, seasonal vegetation health condition is an indicator of agricultural productivity in the region. And what we are, uh, what I think is particularly relevant here is that this relationship is uh, particularly stronger for the regions of West Africa that have the highest risk of acute food insecurity. So if you focus on the top right map, all the regions that are in, shown in the red colors are the regions where we find this connection between subside seasonal climate and uh, yeah, total agriculture productivity to be most strong. Uh, next slide, please. And additionally, another motivation for using subseasonal climate forecast is the existing climate services in the re existing climate service needs in the region. An extensive survey we conducted uh, with the climate service providers in the 19 countries in West Africa highlighted that majority of the climate service providers would find sub-seasonal climate forecasts to be extremely useful. And we also highlight, uh, based on that survey, a number of key climate service needs in the region, uh, which this project aims to address. Next slide, please. So here is an example of a sub-seasonal climate forecast that we are using. On the left, we, we're showing uh, a figure that shows the anomaly of weekly precipitation forecast uh, in terms of multiple climate models. Here in this map, blue colors show more than normal rainfall and red colors show less than normal rainfall. And the top row shows the forecast based on multi-model average and the bottom rows show the forecast in terms of individual models. On the right si side of this slide, we also show the performance of these forecasts. And we find that especially in the critical rainy months, which for West Africa are June, July, and August, there are several regions, uh, over a large part of the region, we find that these forecasts uh, at sub-seasonal scale are uh, performing very well. Uh, next slide, please. So next we show an example of high resolution sub-seasonal rainfall forecasting products that we have put together in this project. On the top right uh, is a map that shows the anomalies of 
consecutive dry days. So it's basically the length of the dry spell uh, over the next 30 days and how it is uh, above or below normal. In this ca case, the red color show that the uh, uh, dry spell is longer than normal. And on the, the figure on the bottom right shows the number of days when the rainfall is above 10 millimeter per day. And likewise, we have a number of these high resolution sub seasonal climate forecasting products that we have uh, put together. Next slide, please. And presently, AgriMap, again, who, which is the uh, regional climate uh, service provider in West Africa and our main collaborator in the region, uh, they are disseminating these high resolution climate forecasting products through their website. Uh, and they are also including them uh, in their 10 days bulletin, helping improve climate services in the region. Next slide, please. So lastly, I just wanted to highlight that uh, using sub-seasonal climate forecasts, we are also developing water deficit forecasts. It's specifically targeted for agriculture purposes and pastoral usage purposes. Next slide, please. And here is an example of what those forecasts uh, look like. The map on top left shows the probabilistic forecasts of water available for agriculture production. Green colors here show a high probability of above normal water availability and brown colors show high probability of below normal water availability. And you can, you can imagine the, the green colors being linked to higher agriculture production and the brown colors being linked to lower uh, agriculture production. The map in the bottom right shows what the forecast of water label in the small water bodies. And though all those points here in the map, they show location of the small water bodies will look like. This particular product is currently in, in development and we, we hope that this kind of uh, yeah, water availability forecast, specifically focusing on the small water bodies, will be help, helpful for agro-pastoral usage in the region. Next slide, please. So I think I'll just uh, end there uh, and uh, acknowledge the contribution of our collaborators, agreement and other team members as well. and. Uh, Look forward to any questions on this uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shad. Uh, so next, let me introduce you all to our last but not least speaker, Philo Gomez. He's currently our survey uh, global fellow for Bhutan. And he's co-developing a service with Bhutan partners and scaling uh, also scaling up capacity building to Bhutan uh, in the use of and application of remote sensing of agricultural monitoring. Additionally, Philo is also an independent media maker. Some of his films are available online on public platforms. Philo believes in the uh, democratizing in geospatial technologies and audiovisual tools for more inclusive conservation and sustainable development to reduce the climate vulnerabilities in the society. Welcome, Philo, and over to you. Thanks, Aparna. Uh, and yes, uh, I will talk briefly here about the service engagement on capacity building and service development in the case of Bhutan. Uh, so if you can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, first, Servir uh, is a, um, uh, in conjunction with NASA Develop program has been teaming up in Bhutan on co-creating, backstopping, developing, uh, develop projects on water security and agricultural monitoring. These develop projects uh, are like a, a sister programs within within the NASA uh, capacity building. Uh, it lasts ten years, uh, in where students from Bhutan that are studying pro in the U.S universities participate in this project. Uh, this project topics are suggested by our Bhutan partners uh, and that address immediate local needs uh, um, that our coll collaborators identify. Uh, our main partners in Bhutan are uh, the Ministry from Agriculture, um, the local forest, uh, the National Plant Pro Protection and the Institute, the Ogien Wangchak Institute for Conservation and Environmental Research, 
Um, so those are the three main organizations within the umbrella of Bhutan Ministry of Agriculture and Forest. Um, again, as I mentioned, these developed projects are short terms, while Serbi projects go deeper and strive to collaborate with partners and close consultations in the hopes of to addressing meaningful local needs. So in the in this effort of capacity building, uh, Servir uh, gave uh, our first workshop uh, last year on November 29, November 30. Uh, this was a two day virtual workshop in Bhutan. Uh, uh, this workshop uh, focused on the use of remote sensing and introduction to Google Earth Engine. Uh, these workshop top topics were suggested by our partners and uh, in where there were 63 participants representing different government organizations within Bhutan. Uh, and this uh, virtual workshop that Servir uh, uh, organizes um, will continue in addressing the specific needs that our partners identify and so on. So you can move to the, to the next slide. So in this capacity building uh, effort uh, in the use of geospatial technologies, Servir strives to make those workshops uh, as gender inclusive as many of my colleagues have uh, stressed in this pre presentation. Uh, in some cases of this training uh, are intentionally addressed to women, such as the July 27, 20, and 30 of last year a workshop in which, um, um, which was imparted by the Hindukush Himalayan Hub, Isimod, based in Kathmandu, Nepal, targeting, targeting or recruiting um, uh, the most participants women. While it doesn't doesn't mean that it's it's solely women, but men participate too as well. So we identify this as a, as a good component that uh, we that in in terms of address gender inclusivity in the geospatial training. Next slide, please. So in this service development, as I mentioned earlier, uh, has been close, it's been in close collaboration with our Bhutan partners, which I, uh, the Department of Agriculture, UISER, uh, the National Plant Protection, and also in coordination with the Bhutan Foundation, which has its office in Washington, DC. Um, in this uh, effort of collaboration, we are uh, co-developing services to creating a national rights body field maps in the context of food security. To achieve these uh, collaborations, um, of course, we have monthly meetings we have in which we update on our progress from both ends, from our partners, but also from our severe end. And also to exchange, to see uh, where we are in the constant revisiting our, our work plan and making sure that we are uh, work, working on the same path at, to address the needs. Um, uh, so next, next slide, please. So in this slide, we see Serbir, how Serbir engages with our, with our partners. Now, I think we have uh, uh, many, we have heard this earlier from our previous colleagues presenting about how how Serbir operates within capacity building and service development. Uh, uh, but allow me to uh, revisit this because. Uh, I consider it's important, and it's one of the the practices that I think it's uh, it's working in the case of Bhutan. First, as as we see here, identify the needs within the stakeholders or partners. Then comes service concept design, co-development of service and service delivery, each addressing characteristics of the needs and capac capacities of the project, all in the hopes to improve this decision making and making meaningful uh, the. Uh, uh, our project. You know? uh, so lastly, as I want to mention, as, as I, I know we're running out of time, as Serbia engages within the Bhutan, not only with herbs directly, but also with countries such as Bhutan. Uh, first, it is demand-driven and partners have equal agency, similar needs, and addressing um, needs and values uh, throughout the process. Uh, the the pro Capacity building and service development are co-developed, which means regional experts uh, within the uh, science coordination office in Serbia and our partners uh, make those decision uh, making to build resilient communities. Now, uh, also inclusive uh, 
emphasizing that services must be accessible and rep represent the needs of women, indigenous communities, and local organizations. Uh, at, and last and very importantly, uh, severe project programs are the ideas are built to last now because prioritizing the need and resources to strengthen local capacity in the spirit of self self reliance. So whatever training, whatever uh, local local is transferred to the local partners can implement, adapt, and uh, make them use and continue uh, uh, their monitoring project in in regarding the research uh, projects and needs. So that's all what I wanted to say. Uh, I'm uh, hoping to entertain some of the questions. Uh, thank you, Parna. Thank you, Philo. Uh, with this last presentation, let's uh, let's go back to answer some of the audience questions and also let's have some panel discussion i'll request all the speaker to turn on their uh, cameras and let's interact so first question i would like to ask to the panel is what challenges do you see in the user engagements while using Earth observation data based tools for sustainable and climate resilient agriculture? Uh, and I'll request Lillian to start on giving some comments on this. Thank you very much, Aparna. Um, I'm sorry that I'm having some issues and we'll have to speak without my camera on. Um, the main challenge in implementing these services is uh, sustainability and making sure that these services can outlive our development cycle and that they transition uh, effectively into the governments. And this means that working not only up, uh, on the technology side to make sure that the technologies that we are using are also sustainable and that they can, um, you know, go on and they would be stable, the systems are stable beyond our handover period, but also making sure that we work with the government to establish the sustainability mechanisms. For example, when we begin implementing a service, we do not only look at its linkage to the decision-making uh, side of things and tying it to the priorities of the government, we also look at what the collaborators and en enablers and the budgets are coming from within the government so that we can align our services to their priorities, but also to their resources and the resources of the collaborators and enablers. And so this means that um, by, by doing that and by engaging the government actively, you, you get to not only have them uh, adopting the services, but also investing and collaborating with the enablers to continue investing in the development and capacity building of these services. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. Uh on this note, I would also uh, like to ask the same question to Fazil. If you have any comments from in the Kushimalayas or in the perspective of Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, yeah. Yeah. related Thanks, to regional challenges. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Aparna. So like in, in recent year, we can see an increasing appetite for the use of observation information and related services primarily originating from fluctuation in prices in agriculture commodities. So countries really want to be self-sustainable and there is a sort of pressure on the governments to make their agriculture system sustainable and more productive. So in, in like maybe 10 years or 15 years back, we, we do have to prove ourselves that these earth observation technologies are useful and we have to generate the interest. At this point of time, I think appetite is there, interest is there, need is there. The one major challenge I see that uh, these uh, technology related functions are not institutionalized. And if we try to develop 
new functions uh, around these technologies, it will take much longer time. So while we are developing this technological platform, if we also look into the institutional setups and try to tweak our service according to existing functions, I think that will lead us to uh, like self-sustainable systems. So when we are working with extension system, we try to add them with some uh, apps which are related to their existing functions. We, we can add few more things, but we try to transform their existing uh, activities to digital systems and then bring it into our service planning. So I think uh, like uh, there are uh, challenges as, as Lillian mentioned, it's related to sustainability, but that, that uh, can be potentially addressed if we look into the institutional setup and try to tweak our service according to that. So I'll, I'll stop here on this. Thank you, Fazil. Uh, I'll request Suzanta um, to talk on some of these challenges from the Mekong perspective. Suzanta, are you there? If he's not, Fazal, can you, uh, there is audience question regarding on the same subject and it is about uh, how can we develop simple and affordable technologies adapted to meet local challenges faced by rural farmers, particularly in the area of irrigation? Yeah, I'll, uh, on, the, on the technology side, I will let uh, Sharad to speak. I think uh, he's in, in a better situation. But uh, on the like uh, local level service provisioning, uh, I, I would like to mention uh, the example which we, we develop, like uh, especially when we are talking about smallholder farming in Nepal or Afghanistan or in Pakistan, then these private advisory services are not really like benefiting smallholders. So the idea is to like uh, develop ICT supported uh, systems which can uh, improve the efficiency of existing uh, investment, which are already being made by the governments. So if whatever technology we bring, we bring within the government system that the, the, those governments are there to stay. And then if we improve their uh, efficiency by, by bringing in new technologies and adding, adding some of the value addition from our observation that, that can really help uh, the smallholders and local farmers. Sharad, if, if I can ask you to please, uh, uh, if you can speak on the earth observation and supporting irrigation system. Yeah, definitely. Would you mind, uh, Aparna, please repeating the question again, just to be sure. Sure. So, uh, Sharad, the question is, how can we develop simple and affordable technologies adapted mm -hmm. to the local challenge, uh, to, adapted to meet the local challenges? faced by the rural farmers, particularly yeah. in the area of irrigation? Yeah, um, so that, that is definitely an important question and, and, uh, and uh, thank you again for the question. Um, I think the way we are going about um, addressing needs of, uh, you know, small holding farmers uh, is just by increasing the access, trying to increase the access to earth observation. Uh, and uh, both remote sensing based and modeling based. And I will just draw upon the examples from our previous projects in uh, Eastern Southern Africa and current project in West Africa. Uh, we're basically relying on web services, uh, services that are based on a web website and so on uh, to provide access to a high resolution, say uh, NDVI data sets, uh, precipitation data set and temperature and so on. And in, in the case of uh, our work with the Eastern Southern Africa hub in our TMRD, uh, we were able to provide access to those high resolution data set, but using uh, a web service that is installed at uh, our CMRD. And the benefit of that has been that uh, even after the project ended, uh, our CMRD was able to uh, add uh, you know, different polygons to the earth observation maps. So the user can extract data over their particular domain and, and so on. Um, 
And in some of those uh, remote sensing data sets, including um, NDVI, especially the higher resolution ones such as Sentinel and so on, can be particularly beneficial for uh, monitoring irrigation uh, condition. Uh, the climate models and their forecasts, they don't incorporate irrigation uh, directly, but there are ways to uh, merge those forecasts with the irrigation information. Uh, I hope that answered the question, but uh, I'm happy to clarify further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shrad. Uh, Pete, I would like to ask you, what are the challenges in scaling respective digital solutions in different countries or regions? Or can you comment more on uh, return of investments or impact of digital solutions in building climate resilient agriculture? Sure, thanks Aparna. Uh, well, first I think that there's just been, you know, this, this panel has really demonstrated so much of what is possible in the use of uh, climate information when it's applied to development challenges around the world. Um, and, and, and one of the key uh, approaches that we've heard consistently from our panelists is this uh, engagement with users and engagement with government partners and other stakeholders, and specifically um, creating services that are inclusive in the way that they're designed and, um, and thinking about how they serve a broad audience uh, for you know, addressing the needs of those who are marginalized and those who may not have historically been parts of decision-making processes to further um, uh, elevate their voices and, and ensure needs are met. So working, uh, you know, both in terms of scaling, I think that we've seen um, just oftentimes it's it's challenging to uh, to kind of know how how something that is so contextually um, designed can be replicated and translated. And I think that to, to a new context or a new geography. And so one of the advantages that we see here is that because we have these um, relationships that, that, that span the globe uh, in these specific distinct severe geographies, we're able to um, come together in our own uh, knowledge exchange and knowledge sharing um, environments and, uh, and, and kind of peek each other's brains about what it is that we're doing, what some of those challenges are, how those are being overcome, as well as um, hearing from others what their needs are that they're hearing about. And then, you know, connections can be made to um, spark an idea for what something might look like when it comes to, uh, to, to serving a new geography or a new group of stakeholders. Um, I think also with, uh, um, we've seen, uh, just from a, a return on investment perspective here, there's been so much that uh, each of these panelists have shown from, um, you know, a USAID investment into these activities, NASA's investment into these activities, the hubs bringing in their own uh, capacity, oftentimes partnering with other uh, funders, um, including host governments, and aligning activities with other interventions that may be um, that, that are that are underway, so that you get this this um, result that is well beyond what could have been expected had it just been taken upon one of those um, individuals and partners. So this this whole network approach uh, and and collaborative approach, I think, is is a real strength. Sure, thank you, Pete. That really summarizes um, the answer and also the entire approach for scaling the particular services and related challenges uh, towards it. Uh, Catherine, uh, would you like to talk in a minute or two uh, about challenges in having the operational monitoring service uh, developed using the Earth Observation data sets? Um, Just quickly in a minute, if possible, because... Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the challenges or um, one of the challenges is keeping so operational systems updated uh, where they're not um, 
so the interface could be, you know, the best, most perfect that it could be, but we have new uh, satellite data, as I mentioned in my talk, as well as uh, newer methods, or simpler ways of doing things or um, ways to augment workflows. So the question is how, how you keep up with that? Like, how do you keep um, people who are operating these systems up to speed? when they're newer data sets, newer methods, newer models, newer outputs, uh, you know, those things can throw people off. And I think that's that's something that we have to keep up uh, with. And um, the hub approach kind of uh, enables that there is a place where, uh, you know, there is someone keeping up to speed with what's, what's outcoming and could be a way of like touching base to keep, you know, to keep uh, people up to up, updated to what's going on. And I think is uh, is really critical. Otherwise, people would be using something developed in the '90s that doesn't integrate any of the newer data in the last 20 years. But just because they have that system, you know, they keep using it. So it is important to kind of figure out um, that operation. It doesn't mean that it runs on the same engine it was built in in 1950. Basically, is, is the point that I'm trying to make. Thank you so much, Katri. So on this note, uh, I would like to summarize our session and would like to thank all the speakers uh, from across the survey network and all these different institutions and our survey partners. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. I would also like to thank our audience, whoever joined for our session today. And uh, we hope that this session was able to convey you uh, regarding digital solutions, especially earth observation data uh, based built digital solutions and how those solutions to be decided, what are the challenges in building those, how they are scaled and replicated and what are the challenges there and how Servir is playing role in it all together. So I hope all these uh, particular questions uh, you would have got some answers to it. Of course, they are not really easy questions, but uh, uh, but that's all we hope that this session will uh, convey uh, regarding it. So once again, um, thanks everyone, and uh, thanks to organizer for having this convey our session. So.